Yeah, I think um, a minute more should do. Hopefully, we should be in a position to start as soon as possible. Thanks again, guys. Oh, let me see. Oh, okay, Zachariah, you can't hear me. Can Can you guys hear me? Am I? Can you guys hear me from your end? Are we yes, still I can hear you. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Okay, so I think I can, yeah, I can start with the introduction. Um, just a quick um etiquette. We should probably uh put our audios on mute just just so uh we can prevent the feedback. I'm trying to monitor something here, guys. Just give me a second. Hopefully, we should be in a position to start soon. Yeah. I think we should be in a position to start. Just give me a second. Good. Um, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much again, everyone. Um, my name again is Farouk Abdus Salam, and um, this is the Graduate School Application Assistance Program. And together uh, with me, I have my team uh, made up of uh, Fauzi Ali, Shafiq Osman, Fatih Salam, Fulera, Amida, and John Ousu. <laughs> Now, in today's in, um, session, which happens to be our very first session, I'll just take a minute or two to take you through the content and uh, give you a brief overview of what the program is intended to do. Um, so my first slide will talk about the introduction, basically um, give you guys um, an idea as to what really motivated this. Then um, I give you an update as to what the past experience has been in terms of our successes. Um, and how to prepare yourselves respectively for the upcoming year. Also the selection procedure, I'll try as much as possible to make it uh, known to you and how fair we can be in choosing the, the, uh, the student. The CV as well, how to prepare your CV. The payment, as I mentioned, uh, you guys don't have to pay anything. Everything will be coming from our end. We try as much as possible to assist with the partial $50 payment. And uh, yeah, that's an important point that I would like to make. In terms of the post-submission and how to prepare yourself post-submission, be it your visa application process, be it your settlement, what we can do to help um, in that regard as well, I'll try as much as possible to make it known to you. Um, I'll also provide an update on the initiative as well as the other issues that might be arising from it, maybe what is the program lineup, when are we going to um, get the students ready and all that. So that would be a point that I probably might want to make uh, in today's discussion. And if you guys have any questions for me, please feel free to do so. Um, you can use the, uh, the chat or you can equally use your mic if um, we open the room for discussion. So that's, I mean, high level, the table, the table of content, what we have for discussion today. Now, let's look at what the background of this program uh, happens to be. I know a lot of you guys joined without knowing the nitty gritties of it. So this will be a good opportunity for me to probably take you through and uh, give you a general view of it. Yeah, so this particular program was born out of the fact that I realized most of students from Ghana and Africa, we are being... Uh, we are all occasionally required to pay for our application fee. And that's quite a challenge for most of us. And on top of the application fee payment, uh, you are supposed to prepare your CV. You're supposed to prepare your statement of purpose, apply for scholarships. And without knowing this, um, without knowing how to prepare all these documents, your chances for grad school is pretty much limited, even though you are a very good student. So that's the challenge that I realized um, being in Canada for almost eight to nine years now. And I was of the view that, hey, maybe uh, there's something that we can, we can do to help our fellow brothers and sisters from Africa um, in that regard. So that's the whole uh, motivation behind this program. So here, what we try to do is to tell you, hey, based on your background, we think you should apply to this program. This is a requirement related to that program. Based on what we've seen on with regards to your CV, this is how you can improve your CV. This is how you can improve your statement of purpose. 
um, in terms of the scholarships, these are the ways and means that you can probably um, put yourself out there uh, to qualify for very good um, scholarships. Now, if you are to get the admission in terms of your visa application, you can get in touch with us as well. Then we can equally come in and share our experiences. Hey, applying for the Canadian um, visa, what are the most important documents that you are expected to gather? Is it only the scholarship letter? Is it uh, a financial statement from your uh, guardian or your parents? If it is someone different, what other documents might be needed? Now, if you are, I mean, successful with your visa application after your um, admission, if you're coming to a province that I happen to know someone, I can quickly put in the call and go like, hey, I have a colleague coming from Ghana or coming from Nigeria or coming from this part of Africa. Can you guys help him and pick him up from the airport, help him settle a bit, uh, get a room for him? So these are the networks that we can I mean, leverage on to get you guys pretty much settled. So that's the idea that we had the broader perspective of we trying to help out our fellow African students. And we thought of it, I mean, deeply. And uh, thankfully in 2021, we started with it and it has been a success. So this is gonna be our third year. This particular year, year we are starting much earlier because of one or two reasons. And I probably might wanna talk more about that much later. Now, um, I think uh, this is um, basically it. One idea that also came to mind is getting to know individuals that happens to be in schools that you are interested in applying and leveraging on their performance. So most Ghanaian students, African students, they come to a particular, I mean, department, they, put, they, perform, extremely, they perform extremely well. And um, you as an upcoming graduate student, you are interested in applying to the same school that this particular individual finds himself. Now, in doing so, you can leverage on the performance of your fellow African student and go like, hey, I'm applying to this particular program. There was a student in your program who did very well. I'm from the same school as he or she is, and I've, I've been able to connect with this particular person and he or she is willing to give me a reference. So would you guys be willing to look at him, um, the reference that was provided? So this is a nice way of getting yourself ahead of the game, even before you start applying. So we are in June, application should open somewhere in November, December. This is a time that I, encourage students to look out for schools and as you look out for schools you look out for fellow Africans look at look out for performances see whether you can connect with them if you connect with them see whether they can put in a word or two for you and um, get uh, yourself started so in my case I happen to be coming from Simon Fraser University as I told you guys or those who might have read my um, profile will see and when you go to Simon Fraser University you can click on this particular link and it will take you directly to this page so here this is a proof this is my profile at Simon Fraser University and you can clearly see that the performance has been um, recognized. So if you're applying to a school in um, SFU, you can leverage on this performance, connect with me, see whether I can put in a word for you, then see as um, soon as possible, if I can, I'll, I'll just put the word for you, then you can start applying, I can equally come in to guide you. You can go to uh, UBC, there is the likes of uh, um, Ajiman, as well, you can connect with him. These are the networks that you can leverage on and you can build on that. So that's high level in terms of what really motivated this program and how we came um, together to I mean, form it. Now, in terms of the primary um, objective, first of all, we are basically trying as much as possible to show you where to find the schools. So the school selection is going to be very important. We also come in to tell you, hey, your CV is not in a good shape. You're using a word to, I mean, write your CV. I don't think that's the best approach. Use LaTeX. If you are to use LaTeX, this is the format that you're supposed to go with. I believe your education should come first before this. So these are ways and means that we can come into, I mean, assist you to, I mean, write a very good CV. And I think I shared a video on that earlier. And also in terms of your statement of purpose, you write a statement of purpose. We see that um, there are some strengths that's hidden. You're not 
We are not really bringing it out. The writing is not that good. So there's a need for us to come in and tell you that, hey, put this particular statement here, put this one there, just so it comes out very well and then clean and uh, get yourself um, a step ahead of the game. Now, in terms of the application fee payment, as I mentioned earlier, here, um, when I started work with Amazon, I was able to get something much substantial. So I reserve a portion of it to assist with the student. So most um, most years, what I do is we assist with 30 students or so. And the partial payment is $50 Canadian. So if you are being selected and we are willing to I mean, assist you with the partial payment, it's going to be $50 Canadian given to you and you pay the other house. So maybe a school in Manitoba, they will require you to pay $100. By um, me stepping in to assist you with the $50, you only pay the other other half. So that's a partial payment aspect of things. So you don't have to pay the full payment. Now, if you go, if we were to probably say, hey, we are coming in to assist you with the full payment, uh, there's, there isn't much in terms of the funds to support full payment. So by making it half, I can extend it to several students, 30 students. But if I'm to go in with I mean, full payment, I can only assess with 15 students, which wouldn't be fair, given the number of students that have shown interest in this program. So in the past, we've seen upwards of 300 students applying. And um, by paying the $50, we can cover at least more 10% of the students coming in. So that's a plan why we choose to pay partial instead of the full. Um, in terms of the other program specification, we can equally come in and also specify what it means and what's not. So I did men make mention of the, um, the secondary objective, guiding you, connecting with professors if we can, um, the visa application process, if we have any document to assist you in preparing, we can equally do that. Settlement, we can um, equally do that to assist you as well. Now, a couple of misconceptions that I probably might just want to be a bit more upfront about is never pay anything. Nothing comes from your pocket to me or to any of the organizers. This is solely a voluntary um, program that we, we rather come in to assist you financially. So you never pay anything, right? Um, I'm very mindful of this because when you hear visa, scholarship, people will go like, hey, he's trying to get money. No, that's not it. We rather come in to assist you. We don't take anything from you. So be mindful of that. Also, we don't promise. Um, also, we don't promise. Yeah. So also, we don't promise um, scholarships. No, we don't, scholar we don't promise scholarships. It's more along the lines of you working hard using the resources that we provided you, getting to know where to find those scholarships and starting to apply. And as you start to apply, we can guide you along the way. So it's not a case of we spoon feeding you, no. You do the work, we come in to assist you, make things much easier for you. Yeah. Now, uh, let me quickly acknowledge the organizers. Um, Fauzia Ali. Um, she's in Ontario. She's a political scientist. Uh, she did a master's in um, in Brock University. She has she has been of immense help. And also um, Shafiq Osman, he's a lawyer currently in the UK. He has he has been of immense help as well. Now Fatih, she's an engineering student in Manitoba here in Canada, and she has been helping a lot in terms of the organization. Fuleratu is also in Canada, Manitoba. She's currently um, studying a um, program related to education, and she has been of immense help to us as well. And also there is Hamida. She's currently in the US, an economist. She's helping with the organization. There is um, John Ousu. John uh, is a colleague of mine as well here in um, British Columbia, Canada. He is a very good writer. So whenever you write a statement of purpose or you write your visa application package and there are loopholes here and there, he can come in and suggest to you that, hey, this is not coming out right. You might want to look at it from this perspective and whatnot. So he has been of immense help coming um, to us. Now, the past applicants that we, we had who were um, equally successful, most of them are volunteering. So hopefully as we grow, uh, we will get more um, volunteers to join in 
and our work will be much easier. So we initially started with maybe four or so students and we currently have eight or more um, students helping in. So that's 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 good news. So we are growing. We are we are we are trying as much as possible to I mean extend the support a bit further. Now, in terms of the history of the number of applicants that we have in the past two years, we've already we've had about six hundred applicants trying to come in and um, apply and see how best we can assist them. Uh, we, as I mentioned, every year as much, we try as much as possible to assist thirty students or or so. So we've so far assisted about six um sixty students, which is al along the lines of, um maybe $5,000. In terms of the number of students that were admitted, we do have a lot of students that were admitted, but currently those we have on board 20 or more in Canada, the US, who are currently pursuing the master's program. So we started small and hopefully um, we are growing. Now, um, in terms of what you need to prepare, and this is gonna be an important, uh, this is gonna be an important note if you are preparing for anything at all in terms of your graduate uh, school, first of all, have a look at the program. Uh, which program are you interested in or the course you are interested in? Is it economics? Is it engineering? Is it political science? Is it business? Look at the class, right? So is are you having a first class, second class upper, second class lower? What is the grade point? And what's the requirement from the uh, university involved? Now, in terms of the year of completion, this is also going to be a dicey issue. If you've been out of school for maybe five or so years and you're trying to get back in, you have to be a bit more tactical about how you go about your CV and get yourself um, well recognized. Because sometimes when, when you are out of school for long, it becomes an issue for most of the admission panel to give you the pass so there's a need for you to restructure your cv get to see how you can make a point just so they can um, give you that chance of getting in in terms of your references this is going to be an important issue as well because when you start late i know lecturers in um, legon ucc tech it's sometimes very difficult to get them to write to references. So when you start much earlier and you inform them that, hey, I'm applying to this school, I would like to use you as my referee, they might equally prepare ahead of time and give you the reference the reference or the references that's, that's required. So keep that in mind. In terms of the flexibility or the change, some of you might be in, in engineering and for engineering, you need to get um, a supervisor before you even start your application process it might be very difficult getting one is it possible for you to transition from engineering to another field these are decisions that you can you can make and you can contact me or any of the organizers brainstorm with them see how best they can advise you to transition just so you can get the chance to get in and also we have session with Professor Solomon. Professor Solomon is an engineering professor here at York University, is a very renowned professor. Um, he will be in a position to advise those in the engineering field, as well as in, anyone um, on this platform on how to apply to schools and how to be a bit more flexible in, in those regards. Also, in terms of the school choice, I know some of you might be coming in with the idea that, hey, uh, I'm going for the top, universities in, in, in Canada or in the US. I think you should be a bit more mindful because of the pros and cons attached to it. If you're going with the very top university, have in mind, hey, what is the acceptance rate, right? Um, what is the transitioning from your master's program to a PhD? So these are things that you probably might want to keep an eye on as you apply to these, um, these schools. In terms of your future goals as well, are you interested in Canada? What are the what are your prospects in Canada when you are done with school? Is it easy for you to um, get a job, get back home, get experiences? So these are decisions that you probably might want to have in mind um, as you apply to schools in either here in Canada or um, our close neighbor in the US. So keep those um those decisions in mind. Now, number of schools to apply. So as I mentioned earlier, we try as much as possible to assist with the partial payment, which is $50. Now, all the resources that we provide you, all the guidance that we provide you, use them. And our strong recommendation is that don't apply to only one school. 
because it's going to be very competitive. It might be the case that you apply to only one school and you got in, or you wouldn't be able to get in, uh, in in that particular program. So to brighten your chance, to so to say, you can equally have a mixture. Instead of applying to one school, you can apply to two schools, just so um, within within the academic window you have a chance of getting in. So please um, have that in mind as well. Also by applying to two schools or three schools, there's a likelihood that you can get all those um, programs that you apply to and they will come with their respective funding. Then you then choose the one with the higher funding to apply for your visa. So these are things that you probably might wanna consider as you apply to um, the schools. So keep in mind, everything that I say here, jot, jot it down. I mean, have your questions. If you are to have any question related to any of the slide, I'm happy to, I mean, come back and clarify further. Now, in terms of the um, factors to consider when you apply to the school, the research, um, you have to research on the schools, right? So currently, most of you might be either in your fourth year or your third year, or you are just, you've just you just completed and do your national service and you don't know anything about um, Canada and how to apply for schools in Canada or the US, um, don't worry. I think um, I do have resources on my website. You can quickly, um, quickly click on the resource, um, have a look at Canada. So this is the, this is the link to the uh, website. You can click here. So this is Canada. This is the map of Canada. It's, it's a very big country. They have provinces, provinces like a region, Greater Accra region, um, Ashanti region and the rest. So this is like, in a way, province is pretty much related to the idea of regions in Ghana. Those in Nigeria, this might be your federal states and all that. So when you go in, when you go to my website, you get to see all these uh, respective provinces. Take some time to research and click on them. So you can click here to see the schools in each region, right? So they give you an idea that in the region like British Columbia, we have University of British Columbia, we have Simon Fraser University where I schooled, we have University of Victoria. Then by looking at these schools, you can equally research on each and every school, whether they have the program that you are interested in. So that's how to navigate through this website. So you have, to, um, this is, we have June, we have from June to somewhere October to do all these research and put down the schools that you are interested in. So I think we do have ample time to research and choose the schools of our choice as well as a program of our choice. Now, um, that being said, you probably might also want to, I mean, check the deadline. So each school has a deadline. So we are in June, check the deadline for each school as you apply, just so you wouldn't be in a position where uh, the deadline has passed and you, you are not in a position to apply anymore. The application fee, check how much each school is applying. I think an average of $100 should be the um, should be the fair application fee per each school in Canada. But again, you can issue you issues check. There are some schools in the US and I think I'll, I'll try and have a session on that. The likes of um, um, Hamida, she's currently in the US. Um, they don't, they don't, some schools wouldn't require you to pay for applications, some, but not all. So I think maybe we can have a session with Hamida and she can take you guys through like how to navigate through um, those uh, waivers as well. Now, check other requirements as well. So if you are in the business related field, what is the GMAT or GRE requirement? Are you in a position to write GRE? Are you in a position to write GMAT? Make sure you, you understand the procedure there. For English language proficiency, I wouldn't recommend anyone to write that. Whenever a school asks you for that, you can just quickly go get um, a waiver from a school. From If you're in Legon, you can get a waiver from the language department and just send it to the school you're applying to, telling them that, hey, English is my primary um, means of communication. And I don't think I need that. Can you guys... Uh, wave, wave that for me and they can equally do that for you. Look at the um, acceptance rate, the transcript, evaluation. Have a look at all these requirements as you apply to each and every school, okay? Um, who just joined? Please um, just mute. Yeah. Now, in terms of, yeah, number of semesters you are expected to complete, I think this will be much later as we discuss. Yeah.
Yeah. So let's go to the next page. Um, I think I'll come in to answer most of the questions much later. Um, yeah. So here, um, yeah, I think I mentioned this. You can look for Ghanaian students or Nigerian students or any African students. Look at the funding options. I think I can talk more about funding uh, much later. Now, you can equally go to this video and get to see, I mean, how to navigate through the website, how to get yourself through the application process. This is a session I had with students. You can utilize that as well. Um, let me quickly go on to the next um, page, which is going to be an important aspect as well, which is your CV. So your CV is going to be very important. And occasionally what I see, actually it's not occasionally, it's mostly all the time, what I see in terms of the applicant that come in, you present your CVs and they are not really in in a format that is acceptable for your graduate school application. So please keep an eye on the CV and how to format it. I think I do have a session here on how to write CVs. Um, make it a point to watch. I have all the respective links on how to write it in the LaTeX, which is a more, I mean, convenient and respectable format. Yeah. Is there is there someone who has the audio on? Um, just give me a second, guys. Let me quickly see. There's, there seems to be someone with an audio on. And it, yeah, and if we can mute, if if we can mute the person, I think that would be great. I would appreciate that. Yeah. So let me quickly go back to where um I stopped in terms of your. CV. I think we had a session on CV, so let's make it a point to address that. We just had, yeah, sorry about that, guys. Just give me a second, let me do this. Yeah, I think I was somewhere here um, where we looked at, the, yeah. So here, please have a look at the session where I, yeah. So here you can see how I, I, I took um, the student through formatting of a CV using LaTeX. So when you go to my website as well, there is a link that shows you how to format your LaTeX using Google or any, um, account that you have. If you have any issue with that, please make it a point um, to inform me. If I if I have time, I can call it, take you guys through. Uh, in case I, I don't have the time for that, hopefully the likes of Lyra and Hamida can um, step in to organize a session for you. Now with the payment, this is, uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the most challenging aspects of the whole I mean, grad school application, because it's very expensive, you can imagine you being asked to pay 1,000, I mean, 1,000 CD for just one application, which is just too much. So this is where we come in and go like, hey, we are going to assist you with a $50 um, payment and you do the rest. Now, how does it work? It's a very simple process, right? So I promise to pay $50 um, when I select you as a... Uh, as a successful applicant. So when you are ready, you inform me that, hey, I'm ready. I would like to organize a Zoom session with you so that I can uh, submit my application. I then use my credit card and do the complete payment for you. I pay everything and, sub and we submit it together. Now you look at the exchange rate in Ghana. For instance, if I pay $100 for you, which is the complete application um, fee, for the program that you apply to, you take $50 part of it, I take $50 part of it. So if I submit everything using my credit card, you would then get in touch with my sister or any of my colleague in Ghana, then you pay the equivalent of just $50 in Ghana City using mobile money or any means of um, transfer to my sister so that's much convenient so again let me repeat if you apply to a school and they are requiring you to pay a hundred dollar you come to me if you are selected i complete everything for you then instead of you paying hundred dollar equivalent in ghana city you don't pay hundred dollar 
you take away the $50 that I promised you and you only pay the rest of the 50. So that's how it works. By doing this, we, we, we for sure um, prevent the high charges that counts with the local transaction. If you have to use a credit card and pay in Ghana, the banks will charge you higher fees. And also how do I even come in to pay the $50 that I promise you um, to your Ghanaian account? So we tend to pre prevent all these um, difficulties. And um, I'm happy to say out of all the 60 payments that we've done so far, from last, I mean, two years to last year, it's been successful and there hasn't been any issue, right? So that's that's something that I'm very, very, I mean, I'm very happy about because it has been it has been something of concern when I started this program. I didn't know how to go about it, but thankfully, with this approach, things have been much easier. Now, when you are to apply, please. As soon as we submit your application uh, package, make it a point to constantly get in touch with your referees. Because when you submit your payment, the link will be sent to your referees, your professors in Ghana that you stated that they are going to be your referees for them to complete your references. You have to make sure that they complete it. If not, if they don't complete your reference letters, <laughs> then it means all the money is that... I assisted you and you also work hard in paying the other half, it's going to go waste. So please make it a point to constantly get in touch with your referees and make sure things are okay. You can confirm, make sure you send your sealed document when they ask for it, your, your transcript, your um, certificate and whatnot. Make sure you do that. So that's going to be very important just so you wouldn't lose money. Okay, now the next thing here is after you are done um, submitting your application, make it a point to constantly check. Have they granted you the admission? How long is it gonna take? Are you part of the first group? Sometimes the admission panel will take some time to select the first group. If the first group, uh, if some of them go like, hey, I don't wanna come this year, they might go to the second group. If you're not part of the first group, be patient. You might be part of the second group. You have to constantly check. If you're not hearing from them, you can quickly send an email to the secretary or anyone in the department that you might know. He or she might equally come in and assist. Um, if you are accepted, then we strongly recommend that you get in touch with either myself or any of the team members. So for instance, if you are to get gain admission into Canada, then we have a lot of... Um, organizers from Canada who can, I mean, assist you. So we have a separate WhatsApp page we currently have where students post questions, past students who have experiences with the visa application can come in and assist them. If it is too much, I can equally come in and assist you guys. If we think we need further, I mean, assistance, we can equally call John Usu to look at the document that you guys are interested in submitting for the visa application. So that's how it works. We leverage on each other's expertise. So last year's group can leverage on this year's group. This year's group might equally help the next group come in. So it's more, more or less like a support system. So keep that in mind. So as soon as you receive your admission, don't delay. Make it a point to contact myself or any of the organizers. We can send you the document that you need to start with your visa application. Make sure you, you submit on time because uh, with these visa stuff, you, you don't know. Sometimes they might you might gain, uh, you, they might accept, some, sometimes they might deny you. If they are to deny you, how can you um, revise your application package to increase your chance of getting getting the visa. So these are the things that you probably might want to keep in mind when you get your, your visa. And again, please, no payment at all. You don't pay anything to anyone. This is more of our voluntary, um, I mean, work. You don't pay any anything anyone. We leverage on each other's expertise. Now, um, to give you an update in terms of how this program will work. This is how I, I run the program. Out of the 300 or so applications that we, we, we always receive, I mostly classify it into four or five. I have the students who are more along the lines of the business-oriented courses. I have the pure sciences. 
I have the arts one, which is basically psychology, sociology, history, and the rest. I have the arts two, which happens to be the math oriented courses along the lines of economics, statistics, um, math, and what's not, and maybe other related fields like development, nursing, and the rest. So we tend to classify them into five. And out of these five groups, we tend to choose four or five students from each and we do the payment. So that's how it, how it works, just so we can give everybody the chance. Now, when we did this, I mean, uh, our experience has been that those in the business field and then the pure sciences field is sometimes very difficult for you guys to, gain, to, to get a supervisor. And because of that, all the monies that we reserve for you don't get you don't you don't use it. So we occasionally transfer the money to those in the arts one and arts two. And that has not been fair to you guys. So we are starting much earlier in June, just so you guys can get to um, get a supervisor or get to a, a program that suits you. And then the funds that we allocate to you, you'll be able to utilize it. So that's the reason why we are starting much earlier to give those in the pure sciences and the business related courses the chance to utilize the funds that we always allocate for them, which occasionally they hardly use. Last year was somewhat different. Those in the pure sciences, they were able to utilize their funds because they applied to schools in the US. And some of the schools in the US weren't really, I mean, hard on getting a supervisor before you even start. So that was a bit more relaxed for them. But again, that has been my experience and I'm very mindful of that. Um, Yeah, so that's been the experience. And again, the partial payment is gonna be $50. The full payment, um, I hardly do that. I think it's mostly when you are part of, like when you are top of the top, then we can do $100. But again, it depends on my budget. Um, hopefully I can do this year, but I'm not really sure about that. Now, when I shortlist students, sometimes the criteria will be that, hey, who has the highest GPA, blah, blah, blah. My experience has been that a student might have the higher GPA, we might select the student, but he or she will not be ready at the end of the day. And that will affect the chances of those who were selected. So that's something I would like to avoid this year as well. And I'm going to start much earlier. So when I'm to select you based on your I mean, GPA and other related um, characteristics, it's not always 100% that you will get it. I will also have to give everybody the chance just so that uh, someone will not renege and it will affect the other. So please, when you are being shortlisted, take it serious. If there's no, I mean, element of seriousness from your preparation or your document that we ask you to revise, then we probably might just want to give the chance to someone else and he or she might equally grab it. And the result from last, um, last few years, you can have a look at it here. Now, in terms of the other related um, topics, I think this is going to be very important. I think this is something that I realized and I think uh, I rather make it known to you guys as you prepare for your grad school. I think LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. Occasionally you use email addresses, you go to the professor's page, you tend to send email, trying to get a professor to, I mean, accept your candidacy or so to speak, and he or she will not, be, will not even mind you. LinkedIn is powerful because most of these professors are on LinkedIn. Now, how does it work? You can connect with me or you can connect with Professor Solomon or any of the professors that I will, I mean, invite over in the next coming months or so, connect with them and use LinkedIn. Now, when you connect with them, there's a chance that we might, myself and a professor that you are interested in, I mean, working with, we might be mutual partners or we might be mutual um, friends. If there's a need for me to connect and, and I mean, speak on your behalf, I can equally do that. If Professor Solomon thinks that's a good idea, he can equally assist you. So I advise you guys to really use LinkedIn, connect with, with me or connect with any of the um, professors. And uh, let's see how best we can utilize LinkedIn. There's also the YouTube. I think I constantly send out the, um, the updates on our WhatsApp 
with our YouTube videos. I think it has been very helpful. The fact that we record these sessions implies that I don't have to come in and record a new session when new group of students come in. They can just leverage on these resources and that, that's just it. They can equally um, use it. So you can equally utilize the YouTube channel, watch the programs there, see how best they can be of help to you. Now, let me quickly uh, go on to the lending um, and point out something very, very interesting here. And those who are, those are, I think I did mention that if you're not on lending, please make it a point to connect with me. If, if you are already on lending and we've connected, I think that's good. Have a look at this post that we, we posted on our program. I think we receive uh, a lot of people reacting to it. One thing that you can equally do here is you can equally react to these posts because we tend to get, I mean, people coming in to ask how best can we assist. An example here is because, because of this particular post, there's a professor who is a professor in economics who saw this and said he is interested in assisting us in terms of giving us an overview as to how to apply to grad school. And I think I, I, I posted his, uh, his name on our WhatsApp group. So make it a point to constantly utilize lending, see how best that can be of help. Now, I mentioned Professor Solomon. Professor Solomon has been of great, I mean, help to us. This is Professor Solomon. He has his WhatsApp page. He's a professor in engineering. Those in engineering, please make it a point to also connect with him, okay? And uh, see how best he can he can be of help. So that's that's a point that I would like to make here. I think this is very important, and we should we should do that. You can react to the yeah. As I mentioned, you can react to the post, like, share. Let's I mean create this uh what's the name the network and see how best we can get individuals to equally come in and share the uh, experience with us so that's one thing i would like to i mean point out before we move on to the next um the next slide now in terms of communication uh please avoid short salutations this is something that i've seen and i think i probably might just want to bring it to your attention you see someone just coming in and say hi hello and just keep quiet. And the person will like you to respond by saying hi. And then the person will go, how are you doing? Then I'll come in and say, I'm doing well. No, this is, it doesn't work that way. If you are interested in grad school or you are interested in getting a connection with myself or any professor or yeah, or any of my connections, you just, you just don't type hello, hi, and leave it as, as, as at that. Say, hi, my name is Farouk. I'm applying to grad school. I've seen your work. You give the full detail of what you really want to do and leave that message. When the person has time, he will reply with the appropriate response. So please, let's avoid short messages when we are trying to, I mean, get in touch with professors or those we are trying to connect with. To, uh, it, it doesn't really augur well for us. In terms of writing, I think writing has been an issue as well. So I really recommend that if you are interested in pursuing your grad school, use this particular book. It's a very short book. It's called Elements of Style. It will help you with your writing as you get to grad school. And hopefully you get good at um, with writing your statement of purpose, your visa application documents and whatnot. So please utilize this, um, these um, resources. This is one or two things that I've observed, and I think it's, it's better I bring it up. Now, in terms of our program lineup, um, we'll meet Professor Joseph Asuma, who is a professor in Manitoba, I mean, fairly shortly. Then Professor Achua Megashi is a professor in golf. He's also com coming to give us a talk. Then I'll invite Professor Solomon as well to come and give us a talk. Then there's Professor Alex Wally. He got in touch with us because of the lending post that I mentioned. He's also a professor in economics and he's going to give us a talk as well. And I also organized a session with our past, I mean, successful applicants. And it's going to be an open session. You guys can come in, ask them any question at all, see how best they can assist. And uh, hopefully you can utilize the resources that they provide. Then lastly, we will just present a short list of our applicants that's we think uh, we can, I mean, afford in terms of the payment of the fees. Then um, from there, we move on to the next step. Now, I think there was a last question. There's a question about my experimental group. Yeah, with my experimental group, this is something that I work as my as a researcher. I'm an economist, an experimental economist. 
currently have time to work on research. So I organized this experimental group where I run my individual experiments. And whenever someone participates, I pay the person for participating. Okay, so this is what we call experimental econ. So the, we have a separate um, WhatsApp channel for that. If you're interested in getting to know how that works, feel free to join. This is something that I just started a month or, or two ago. Um, I think it will be good whenever you are you're interested in learning something along the lines of psychology, economics, and design of apps and all that. Feel free to join the group. We can discuss um, our findings there. And that's all about it. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry I've taken enough time. Uh, let me open the room for discussion. You can write in the chat room or you can equally use the mic. Either works for me. So we have Prince Ian Su. Prince, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, go ahead, Prince. Yeah. Yeah, hello, sir. Yes, please. Thank you so much for organizing such a program. You're welcome. Yes. Who want to apply for? I learned for you, I say, there is this problem that you have to put your application. This is a SOFAS. And looking at the SOFAS, the kind of requirements they need, you have to do the worst evaluation by the GI and that stuff. I want to find out if you can help us get on the list of the school that you don't need to apply to the SOFAS. Okay, so that's yeah. the I have for now. Oh yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So um in my case, um, and again, I think I don't know whether Hamida is here. Maybe Hamida can be of I mean help as well. So in my case, um, if you look at the list of organizers that I mentioned here, uh, let me just quickly go back and maybe I can give you. Yeah. So this is these are the list of organizers that I mentioned, right? And if you if you look at it carefully, most of us are based in the in Canada. And in my case, what I've done to help you guys select schools in Canada is what I mentioned here in terms of um, navigating through this website here. And these are the schools that you can find in Canada. Uh, and, uh, and it's mostly along the lines of you doing your own work along those lines. Now, in terms of the sofas that you mentioned, I don't know whether Hamida is here to, I mean, true a two cent to this. Um, she is from the US and um, she also, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, she might be in a position to, I mean, tell us what is more along the lines of application fee waivers and whatnot. I don't have a specific website that can shortlist that. I think this is a very good question. I can speak to Hamida, Samira, see whether we can have a link to that. If we come across that, I think we can share that on the WhatsApp page. Um, it's, I, I'm fully right. Is Hamida here? If she's here, she can equally add one yeah. or two. Hello, I'm here. Yeah. Go ahead, Amida. Oh, okay. So um with the schools requirements, I think they differ from schools to schools. Some schools will require you to send your transcript for it to be evaluated. Some will not do that. So um choosing schools is a bit difficult because you have to make sure you meet all the requirements. So what I advise is you search for the schools. You look at their requirements. If they are requesting for something you don't have, you can put that aside and go for schools that are a bit flexible in some of their requirements. I know most schools don't require GRE and the transcript evaluation. So you just put those schools aside and then just move on with those that are not requesting for that. And some too can be waived when you tell them that <laughs> your skill. So the main purpose of this evaluation is to know the kind of the great skill that was used in in your school. I think for UCC and Legon, they have been using the 4.0, tech have been using the 5.0 and UDS. So if you explain to them that oh you attended a school and the great points used was the 4.0 and you make a request for them to waive it, they might be willing to waive that. But for now, I don't actually know what schools are what schools are having that as their requirements and what schools are not. We would have to actually sit down and look through them. Yeah. Totally agree. I think I I think I agree with that as well. Um and that's a very good point. Um 
friends. Now, can we quickly go to, and thanks again, Hamida, for stepping in to clarify. Uh, can we quickly go to um Prince I and Sue? Prince, if if you don't mind you um if you don't mind using the mic, please go ahead. Hopefully we can um pick your question more direct. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Sure. Thank you, mm -hmm. Okay. Um Jane, Jane, please go ahead if you have any question. Um, yeah. Um Jane. Okay, if there's no Jane Rash uh, Rashid, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for your And I must thank you for that impactful presentation today. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I'm really excited to join your group today. It's really helpful so far. Mm. Um, however, I have a question on how we could actually professionally link to it link with professors on LinkedIn, because that is more, though it's mostly used for official purposes. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether there is um, some specific differences on writing to professors on LinkedIn as compared to that we do with um, emails. That is what I have. And secondly, I would also like to know whether it is possible to get application fee waivers in just like we see some in, in the US. I mean, how helpful is that to uh, 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 improving your chances or acceptance rate? Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I think that's a very good question, um, Rashidi, if I got the um, the name right. Yeah, with um, with LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn, as I mentioned earlier, is a very powerful tool. And with some of the professors, they are very active on LinkedIn because they tend to post um, some of their work, some of the conferences that they attend, um, some of the research that they find to be very, I mean, helpful. They tend to, I mean, post, post um, these related research or articles on LinkedIn. Now, what I, I mean, personally, what I observe from the industry is that when these professors post the, uh, I mean, or researchers post the uh, work on LinkedIn and you constantly react to the uh, post and you comment on it and you tend to show interest in what they are doing, uh, Prince Aisu, please, uh, you tend to show interest in what they are doing, it tends to give you that connection or that um, uh, feasibility that you are trying to, I mean, I mean, get there is that the aspect of you writing the cold emails to them using the uh, uh what's the name the uh, email, but the the probability of they seeing that particular email is is almost zero, or even when they ask to see it, what you tell them is not what they are interested in 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 um in pursuing. So to further increase your chance using LinkedIn, if they are present on LinkedIn, is gonna be very useful. Now, one thing that I can equally mention is sometimes when you are trying to get connection with, I mean, professors or maybe uh, professionals on LinkedIn, the idea of connection is very, very important. So if, for instance, you are connected to me and I'm connected to that professor or you are connected to me, or sorry, you are connected to Professor Solomon, who is in engineering, and he is connected to that professor, when you send a request, there's a tendency that they can show the mutual connection and you can they can equally, I mean, utilize that. Or maybe you can just send it to me. Hey, I'm interested in this professor. Do you mind helping me? You can equally use that connection to to I mean get in touch with that that person. So I'm not I'm not totally against the idea of using the emails on the website. I think that's a very useful, I mean, avenue, but at the same time. You can utilize LinkedIn to your best of uh, to to I mean get, gain some advantage there as well. Now to your quest um second question, which is more along the lines of application fee waivers in Canada, I've not come across any in Canada. Just to be frank with you, there is that possibility in 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 the US, but not in Canada. I've not seen any, and I might be wrong, but the truth as it stands now here is I've not seen any in Canada. Yeah. Do you have any follow-up right. on that, uh, Rashid? I really do appreciate for that response. Yeah. Sure. No, not really. No problem. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do we have Benis? Benis, go ahead before uh, we move on to Imran, then Falila. Benis? And probably for the last time, Benis. So if Benis is not there, can we go with um, Imran? 
Imran, do you mind using the mic? If Imran is not, yeah, go ahead, Imran. Hello, thank you uh, once again for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Mine, um, I have two questions in one. First, those, if in case you are not um, helping those who have been shortlisted, would you still be willing to help us through the process, provided I want to pay my own for my own uh, application? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think we 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 do that. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a possibility. We've done that in the past. Yeah, so that shouldn't be a major issue. Yeah. And with the second part, it has to do with the scholarship availability. Mm -hmm. We see some that. It's not coming from the school directly. You may have to apply through a second institution. Mm -hmm. Would you also help us find out those that will be applicable for us for the various institutions? Uh, so scholarship is 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 quite a dicey issue, and I th I'm happy that you you brought it up. So let me quickly clarify the idea of scholarships. Um, again, this is to everyone on the on the page. So when you talk about scholarship, um, my understanding from students is that they think scholarship, they, they tend to, I mean, pursue the idea of funding as only limited to scholarship. And that's very, very narrow in the sense that there are other avenues that one can utilize. So let me just spend the next two minutes to clarify the sources of funding instead of just saying scholarship, right? So sources of funding is broad. The very first source of funding is what our, our um, colleague just mentioned which is the scholarship. And what is a scholarship? Scholarship basically goes like, hey, you are the best among the applicants. And we think um, based on your qualification, we are going to give you a scholarship. With that particular scholarship, you're not going to work. You're not going to do anything. They're going to give you the money. It be it bi-weekly, monthly, and off you go. Now, there are other sources of funding as well. The second idea of funding is what we call teaching assistantship or research assistantship. So it might be the case that you didn't get a scholarship because you were just the second before the first person and uh, the department goes like, hey, we have teaching assistantship. So with teaching assistantship, you assist with teaching the students and grading their scripts and the school will pay you based on that and sometimes that can be sufficient to pay your fees and i mean address some few related expenditures that might come your way that's a second that's a second source of funding so i mentioned scholarship where you don't have to work teaching and research assistance assistantship where you have to work the third sources of funding is what we call bursaries so bursary basically goes like hey you apply to this particular school you came in but you know circumstance do change and because of the change in circumstance you 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 you've not been able to pay your fees you can apply to bursaries and that is to say based on your recent financial i mean situation which is a bit dire you want the school to assist you pay maybe some aspect of your fee or maybe assist you financially the school can come in and assist with that so that that's a third one now another source of funding and this is a bit more related to those in Canada, is the work hour, right? So whenever you come to Canada, you as a student, initially it used to be 20 hours a week. Now it's no more, I mean, 20 hours a week. You can work as much as you can. You can work out of campus, do your own stuff while schooling and pay for pay for your fees or your expenditure that can, might come your way. That's the work hour, I mean, specifically given to students or anyone who has a student visa in Canada. So that's a, that's a fourth source of funding. Now, another source of funding is you can equally invite your spouse, right? You might be married, but you came in, things are tough. Your spouse is in Ghana. You want to, you can invite her over based on what we call open work permit. So you can apply a visa for her to join you. Then she or he or she can work whilst you are in school and the two the two of you can assist each each other based on the number of hours that she she gets to work and the money that she's she's been able to i mean accumulate at the end of the day so that's the work visa aspect of it so so far i've given you guys maybe five and there are other sources as well so if you are thinking about funding in general please don't narrow it to scholarship make sure you understand all these five sources and uh, if this, there are many of these sources are to motivate you, 
I mean, use them as a motivation tool to apply. Now, to your main question, whether we have, uh, we have the resource to point to you where to find additional means of funding. I think that would be too much too much of an ask from us from our perspective i don't think we have that as it stands now i think the school's resource should be the best one for now we don't have any i don't know whether that answers your question if you have any follow-up please do ask that does very much uh, thank you very much for this enlightening answer sure anytime um who is next um is it falila to alidu yeah Falila to all you do, are you using the mic or can we give it to someone else? If not, we can give it to Jane. Hello, Dr. Farouk, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, thanks. Hi. Yeah, I'm using the mic. Please, okay, can you hear good. me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, please? I can hear you. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this information. So my first question is with regards to the um, uh, Muslim securing a, a professor before one starts to apply. You made mention that with the sciences mm. one has to secure a supervisor before mm. you started the application so mm -hmm. and with the arts when when and, and then maybe um, you're about to like you would want to pursue a arts called social science or something and then you want to go into research mm. how do you secure a supervisor I mean, they they already told you before your application you wouldn't have to secure a supervisor so along the line when do you come in to say you would want to work with this provider, how does it work with someone who wants to pursue a social science course? And my other question too has to do with the appropriate time for you to contact, email a professor or a supervisor in case you would want to secure a, a, a supervisor yeah. before you want to start with your application. When is the appropriate time? Considering the fact that you would want to apply to school this year, when is the appropriate time for you to do that? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, just to answer your question, I believe you are more along the lines of the arts-related courses, so I, that should be fairly easy to answer. Uh, so in your case, um, the arts, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need a supervisor at all before you even apply, and that and that's mostly the case. Um, when you get in in the master's program, they don't really require you to do more of a research, even though there is a research, it's more along the lines of, I mean, so watershed, I mean, it's not really, really um, heavy research, right? So that's your MA paper or end of semester paper. And you just identify one particular, I mean, topic. If you think someone in the department is, I mean, more interested in that topic, then you tend to work with the person. And that's not an actual supervisor, so to say, is more, more or less someone who is trying to guide you, finish your MA paper or your thesis work. Now, when you come in, moving from MA to, I mean, PhD is where the trick is for those in the arts. So when you come in, you understand the system, you understand the topic that you're interested in, I mean, writing, you read papers, then one particular topic might be of interest to you. That's where you start to, I mean, write your own portfolio, get to understand the topic very well, get to see where the supervisor or where the writers are, who are those writing these interesting stuff. And you can start tracking their school. When you track their school and you get into their PhD program, the very first year is going to be more or less like you're in your PhD, you're trying to do coursework. And after that, you can then approach that particular supervisor who you think his or her work interests you. So for now, I would say those in the arts, getting a supervisor is not, is not your top priority. It's something more, maybe two or three years along the lines where you are done with your MA, you started with a PhD and you really want to get something done in a particular field that you think this particular person is doing it. That's where you do the actual PhD work, which is the actual thesis. But your MA work is just going to be a term paper. So it's not actually a supervisor case. It's, I don't know whether that answers it. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Jane, do you mind um, taking the mic? And if Jane is not ready, we can go with Venice. And if Venice is not ready, we can go with Tofik. Jane, go yeah, ahead. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's unfortunate you are hearing a man's voice. 
Oh, yeah, I can. I'm imagine. having problems yeah. with my neck. That way. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I'm having a problem. I'm Jenna either. Sorry. Um, we can go with Benis, then maybe um, allow Jane to join shortly. And if okay, to. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um. First of all, thanks for putting this together. And I reached out to you on we LinkedIn. Supervised in Canada. But as I'm pleading whether there is a way for anyone to assist us in terms. So sorry about that guys. environment and engineering field. Let me let me quickly get back to um let me get let me get back to you, Jane. I think Benny is, is is on the mic. Um yeah, um, Jane, we'll come back to you. Uh we had an issue That's with okay. you. That's okay. Yeah, um, go ahead, Benny. No, Ben um Benny, go ahead. I think I'll I'll get oh, okay. back to Jane. Yeah. Um so. my question, I think you uh probably answered it, but I was cut off. I was um, I know you mentioned that you get about 300 applicants and then you choose 30 that you support, uh, but would you still provide the resources and um, the support with, you know, the visa application and all that, even if they're not chosen mm -hmm. for the uh, partial payment? And then do you have, I guess, local um, resources or resources on your site for a GRE, um, you know, preparation and the test as well, whether locally or in one of your sections that sessions that you have. Yeah, um, that's, I think that's a very good question. In terms, let me answer the very first one. If you are not shortlisted, I think I I make that point very clear to all the applicants when we finally shortlist. Um, the student, I, I just make it a point to you guys that hey, it's not based on your uh, your your GPA or your qualification. And um, it's basically the limitation is mostly along the along the lines of my budget or my pocket. So the fact that you are not selected does not mean that you, you do not qualify for grad school. It just basically means that my funds weren't, I mean, I mean, sufficient enough to support you. So that being said, I will really encourage you guys to stay on the page. And most of the students do stay on the WhatsApp page, even though they are not shortlisted. And what they do here is, um, Along the way, they utilize all the resources, they utilize all the CV seminars that we have, they utilize all the seminars that we have with the professors, they equally, I mean, get the application package ready. And they go like, hey, you've not been able to, you didn't select me, I understand that, but I'm ready to pay full payment. Can you assist me using your credit card? I can step in and assist them. I do that. And also they stay on the page when it's time for visa application assistance. They can utilize the page. They ask questions. We come in to assist and we do that. So students do have that understanding that if they are not shortlisted, it's not because of their qualification, but it's because of the fact that perhaps I'm I'm poor, so I've not been able to support them fully. Now, in terms of um, your second question, which has to do with the GRE preparation and local um, preparation, I don't think we have resources to that. I think that's a very good question. I think I can ask my students who happen to have um, business related background because those are the students that are required to write GRE or GMAT. If they have any strong suggestions, they can probably post it on the page and uh, those on the page can equally utilize those resources. I think that's a good question. I can get in touch with Augustina and the rest of the um, the group who happen to have um, math, re uh, sorry, business related background and took the GRE. I think they can um, step in and answer those related I mean, questions. Uh, let me know if I answered your question, Benis, and I'm happy to I mean, address. You did, you did. And then your website, we can get that um, access to that through your LinkedIn, correct? I, I I couldn't catch that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, we can have get access to your website through your LinkedIn. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sure. And Fulera, please. Um, Fulera or Hamida of Operas Fatih, can you guys post the link to the website on the chat? Maybe they can equally, I mean, assess it directly. Yeah. Um. Um, Jane, please go ahead. I think we had a bit of um, an issue with your mic. If you're not there, perhaps we can just move on to Tofik, then to um, Rashid. Tofik, do you have a question? Sorry. Yes, please. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for organizing this. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's been very um, 
informative. Uh, I've got a lot from that. I wasn't here from the beginning, though, but uh, I, I was able to get a lot. Okay, so my question has to do with um, um, the business field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've actually, I think I've, I've ever asked you before, and again, I want to ask, I've, I've done a lot of research around US and uh, Canada, mm -hmm. but mostly the requirement is, is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to GRE, GMAT, uh, and other um, tight requirements. So mm -hmm. I don't do, I, I want to suggest if that is possible, mm -hmm. that if it's possible to get maybe a resource person Mm -hmm. to maybe help on this in our next maybe session mm -hmm. so that he could he could um, um enlighten us on how we could uh, maybe find a way around that mm -hmm. uh, to deal with it mm -hmm. uh, i'll be very grateful i don't know if you could also throw more light on it mm -hmm. uh, yeah Yes. I think I think that's a very good question, and um, I'm happy you you brought it up. Um, so with the business related courses, I think the idea here is um, those doing the business courses, uh, are more or less like the working class. So the business schools do design the programs to fit them. So you have this, I mean, MBAs and um. Those, I mean, high level related programs that are mostly trying to attract those already in the industry. And the fact that they're already in the industry, no matter the fees, um, those in the industry can equal, can pay for it. So it becomes a bit of a struggle. Even if you have to get in, the fees are just too much, you can't pay and all that. An idea I had in mind, and I think I did discuss this with one of the um, professors in the business field, and I'm happy that you brought it up. Hopefully I can get in touch with him through Professor Solomon as well to see whether we can organize a session on that, was to see whether you can have um, more or less like um, going through the back door. So those doing the business, uh, you can use the idea of public policy and public policy is not as expensive as the MBA related programs. So when you have a public policy program that you're interested in, get to see whether you have the qualification, which I think most often you should be in a position to qualify. Use that one as your first step. And if you are to get in and understand the system, then you can then transition to an MBA program. By then you already have your PR or your citizenship and paying the business related program courses wouldn't be that expensive but coming in direct as a business student i think that's going to be a challenge also please get in touch with me i mean offline i can also give you um augustina's number see how she managed to i mean get into the business program hopefully that can be of help to you as well so those um i have two action items get the professor and also i mean get augustina's number for you Let me know if that answers your question. And um, maybe we can go to Abdullahi Ishaku. I think Rashid, I think I answered your question already. So we can go to Ishaku before coming back to you. Or maybe we can go to Razak and Ishaku before coming back to Rashid. Rashid, did you answer your question? Did you ask a question earlier? Yeah, I asked. Yeah. And Tofik, did you have a follow up before I move on? To yes, please. yes, please. Yes, go please. Yes, please. I have a. Sure. Um, you mentioned that I get in touch with you offline. How do I do that? On LinkedIn or WhatsApp? Which WhatsApp, you... WhatsApp, should, WhatsApp should do. I think that's uh, more direct, yeah. Then I also thought of, um, you mentioned using the public policy mm -hmm. as a means to maybe get there. Mm -hmm. uh, with with my um, research and a lot, um. I've also resorted to use data analytics because that is also what I find as a substitute for my um, business field. Uh, I don't know if that also has uh, some uh, roadblocks that, um, that might be a problem, that might cause a problem. Okay. Um, 
I'm not sure. I've not thought of it along those lines because when you are talking about data analytics, data science, and um, those related data courses, maybe you might need some element of statistics in there, which I doubt um, those with the business courses might have. But again, this is me just, I mean, thinking on top of my head, I might be wrong. But it's 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 a good point to raise. Um, we can uh, discuss that further if need be. Sure, sure, sure. So um, this is the last question. Sure, Please, uh, is your reach extended to Germany, or it's just USA, Canada? I think it's mostly USA, Canada. I've not tried anything on along the lines of Europe. I think we, I think we did one on. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about Europe to be frank. I'm not sure about Europe because it's mostly they have very limited funding uh, compared to the opportunities here in North America. But again, yeah. yeah but again, yeah. open to I mean, exploring that if anyone sees anything interesting there. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Go ahead, guys. Um, right. any questions for me or questions? Thank you very much. Sure. You're welcome. Anytime. Any question for me? Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes please. Yes, please, is up, Razak. Okay, go ahead, Razak. Okay. Yes, please. I have applied to one of these private universities. I think University of Canada West. Mm. Okay. Yes, I've gotten the admission, mm. but uh, there's this letter of admission that I have to maybe get. Mm. There is a requirement that I have mm. to pay a deposit. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, it's not an easy amount, about seven thousand nine hundred Canadian dollars, mm -hmm. before the letter of admission is issued for you mm -hmm. to apply for your visa. Mm -hmm. So, when you find yourself in this situation, what do you do? I think that's a very tough question. These are mostly private. Um, these are mostly private schools, right? And they use that one as um, the major sources of their their funding. They don't want a situation where you come in and uh, you go like you don't want to come to their school and um at the end of the day it will be to their detriment. Um if you are to apply to a public school, they wouldn't ask you to pay that much. They would they the the highest you pay is five hundred dollars for just the placement. So you have to keep we have to I mean how I mean keep in mind those here that there is a difference between a public school and a private school. And a private school is what um Razak just mentioned, which is University of Canada West or maybe Columbia College and the rest. And with the private schools, you have to be a bit more mindful. Some of them, I think there is a there is a recent article that's that just came out um that talks about um some fraudulent activities because those schools were not really registered and they were using that to i mean get um, students in and when students i mean come in and they finish the program they cannot even get their work i mean permits and all that for university canada west i think i've seen it here it's in british columbia if i'm right um the seven thousand might be high and again it's because of the fact that this is a private school if you are to have the seven thousand and you're interested in paying you can pay for sure but again, you have to also have in mind that you also have to raise enough money to show the visa officer that you are in a position to help yourself while um, whilst in Canada. So it's going to be very, very, very dicey. Do you have the 7000 to pay to invest in Canada West? That's the very first question. Do you have enough funding to show to the visa officer that, hey, you are in a position to fund for yourself whilst in Canada? If you don't and you pay 7000 they give you the letter, you apply for the visa and the visa officer denies you, how do you get your money back? I'm sure they will tell you that they'll give you the money back, but they'll take maybe 5% off or maybe 10% off. Are you in a position to uh, afford that? So let's be a bit more mindful with the private schools. I know, I know, I mean, people will come in using these private schools, but we just have to know the difference and the pros and cons that comes with it. And that also relates back to the question um, the earlier participants asked about the issue of the business. So these private schools, you can use the diploma courses to get into the business course. That's an alternative. But again, it's going to be expensive as Razak just mentioned. Razak, do you have a follow-up on that? I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, let me quickly pause. Um, let me... Um, do If you guys... Uh, Fulera and um, Fatip, can you please, can you guys please address the questions in the um, in the chat 
I need to drop off maybe a minute or two and I'll, I'll join you guys shortly. Uh, Fulera, can you take over? And uh, if Fatih or, and Hamida also have anything to say on the questions, I'll come back and address any other question that might come. Is that okay, guys? Fulera, Hamida. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'm here. Yeah. Sure. So I'm um, I'm checking the questions. Mm -hmm. See whether you can ask you can answer any question or you can comment on anything that was discussed. I'm just um uh, Hamida Fatih as well. Do that. I'll join you guys in a minute or two. Okay. Um, Prince, you still have your hands up. Do you still have questions or it's from the previous time you raised your hand? No. Um, there are two princes on here. I'm Prince Fiat. Oh. The first guy who asked this Prince I used to. Oh, okay, okay. So you can you oh. can ask. Yeah. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um I'm Prince, yeah, Prince Fiat from Accra, Ghana. Let me start by saying that uh, I think this is honestly laudable. Um, I know for Zia Ali personally, I've what's up there to um, show my appreciation because I didn't know this was something huge. And even the fact that you guys support um, applicants with either full or partial payment of application fees, come on. <laughs> like, who does that? May Allah bless you guys. Yeah. So my question is simple. I would want to find out um, for all of the applications that you assist applicants uh, to put in, is it for the September intake in various schools? Or if an applicant is interested in, let's say, the winter intake for a Canadian school that starts in January, are you able to assist or almost everything has to be for May resumption or September? Thank you. Um, Sister Fati, do you want to answer or I can go ahead? Um, yeah, go ahead and answer. Okay, so um, yeah. with the intake, you decide um, when you want to apply. Basically, the main... Um, term for admission is for intake. So that is what we assist with. But you can, for myself, I applied for four intake by due, due to some visa delayed, I deferred to winter intake. So it doesn't matter the intake you want to apply to. The most important thing is getting the admission, yeah. All right, thank you so much. You are welcome. Um, we have Abdul Rashid Adam. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you once again. You're welcome. So, my, my question is Is it mandatory to have a research so, proposal before you make a move in contacting a professor? Or is it encouraging to do something of that sort? Uh, then my second question is um, I couldn't get due to network issues i didn't get the uh, uh uh the criteria in selecting your, your your criteria of selection for the student that you'll be supporting i didn't get that i don't know you could enlighten me on that um, okay you're welcome stuff at please can you answer the first question on research proposal or oh, hamida I can, yeah, I'm, I'm here too, if, okay. if you guys want me to start. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Uh, what was the question again? I, um, I, I, I... Okay. If it's um, mandatory to have a research proposal when applying to a school. Oh. Okay, it depends on the program. What program? Yeah, that's Geography. What program? Geography, geography. 
geography. So you would have to look at the school you are applying to their website. So when you go through their website, they have their um requirements. And if in the it's required for you to have that, then you have to um have a research proposal. But um I don't think most school will require that. So you would have to look at um a variety of schools to decide like which one you would want to go for. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, and and um on the maybe if they have a separate application for a funding or scholarship opportunity, they might ask for research proposal or something, yes. a research statement on um, a topic you intend to do a research on. So okay. with this is is limited to the school or the program you are applying to. It depends on the school and the program. And okay. Your second question, Brother Farouk, is asking for the criteria for selection. Oh, yeah. The, um, our criteria is going to be um, mostly along the lines of, now that, yeah, now that we have enough, um, I mean, organizers, the likes of Fulira yourself, Hamida, and Fatih, and others as well. I mean, our initial criterion was along the lines of the GPA. But as I mentioned earlier, um, some individuals do renege. And um, it's it's it affects others. So I don't think the GP the, the only the GPA might be the uh, the key pointer for now. We probably might want to add other factors like how good is a CV, how good is your statement of purpose, how consistent are you with um I mean shortlisting of your schools, how serious are you in terms of the program in in mind. So we do have at least um three to four months where we bring these resource um, persons to as assist us with our decision-making process. I do have the CV session where you can watch and write a CV. So if at the end of the day, um, we are ready to shortlist and you present a CV, which is not really good, and having in mind that you had all these resources and you weren't able to utilize it, then your GPA wouldn't be enough for you. Your GPA might just be 50%. But the other okay. factors might equally come into, um, I mean, assist. So it's all about the seriousness. Just so we make, I mean, uh, okay. a very good decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, I think Ben. Sorry, was there any question that I missed? Um, Lira and Hamida. Hello. I think a question from Ben is. Benis, are you here? I'm happy to address that question on environmental oh, yeah. and sustainability. Yeah. Benis, are you here? Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think, I mean, first of all, one thing I would like to address is if you are, I mean, applying for a PhD field and you are coming from Ghana, I'm not saying the chances aren't there. I think there's a chance that they will admit you but compared to someone who has already done a program here in MA or master's program in a related field, the person will have, I mean, the the advantage. So the very first question here is, is the person looking, is, the, is that particular person um, from Ghana or from Africa seeking for a PhD opportunity direct? If that's the case, then there's going to be I mean, a hurdle that he or she has to jump because um, a master's program in, in, in Africa might not necessarily prepare you for the US or the uh, Canadian system. So my advice here is instead of shooting straight to a PhD, there's always the conservative I mean, route where you already have the master's program in Africa, but you apply for an additional master's in the US or in Canada. When you finish that master's in the US in Canada, which is just going to be a year or two, you understand the system. You understand where to look. That way you can move on to the PhD I mean, system more smoothly. But if you are coming from Ghana or Africa for that matter, and you are coming to a PhD program direct, mind you, the very first year of the PhD program is going to be a comprehensive exam stage where you don't do anything apart from taking courses and writing an entrance exam. So if you don't know the system very well, you just came from Africa in a PhD program, just writing exams here and there, you might not necessarily be settled. And when you take the exam in your first year of PhD, you might not pass it. 
So that's the danger there. So my advice is be conservative. Move to the MA or master's route, understand the system, then get into the PhD. The first year of the PhD, you write your comprehensive exam in a more comfortable manner. Then you can get to, I mean, I mean, pass it and uh, move on to the next I mean, stage. I don't know whether this answers it. Very and, yeah, it, it does. I think, um, sorry, I was connecting with Jane on it. And um, I think one of the things they're finding difficult in finding a supervisor, as you said, is maybe what area they want to study. But it makes sense. It sounds like you're saying maybe go the master's route. Mm. And then once you build that connection and understanding of the system, look to see the PhD um, route. Then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there... Anyone in your, I guess, part of your network that is studying uh, environmental and sustainability? It, um, I know you said there will be some students and others that will come as professors as well, but is there anyone in your network that has gone that route? Um, I think I know professors in the field of environmental um, sustainability, more along the lines of fisheries. Um, there's also research, um, resource econ uh, management here at SFU. There's, that's also a related field. I know there is a, there is a student in, in um, what's the name, Quebec, who is also doing something more related, but more along the lines of um, atmo atmos atmospheric uh, program, climate change related, I think. I do have a student who was part of this program and is currently in Quebec. I mean, studying something more, I mean, much related. Happy to, I mean, connect the two, see how best you can you can leverage on that connection. Okay, all right, that's the answer, yeah, thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, any other questions that um, we might have skipped? And also with the PhD program, this is not only related to environmental and sustainability, it's, it's more along the lines of all the fields. Those doing economics, if you already have masters in Ghana, please don't jump to a PhD in, in Canada or the US direct. It's gonna be very, very difficult because the first year is gonna be comprehensive exam and those are gonna be math related. So you find it very, very difficult. This is not the case in Europe. In Europe, when you get into the program, PhD program, you're just going to start research right away. You don't write any entrance exam. North America is very different. So please, let's have that in mind. Um, if there are any questions, please let me know. Happy to address them. You can use the mic as well. Yes, this is Abdullah Sahak. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, we have learned a lot, and then uh, my part of part of my questions has been addressed just by your your recent uh, uh, answers. Yes. But uh, what is left out is I I want to know whether it's possible to get even funding or, or graduate assistantship with a, a second class degree. Or, or GPA, second class uh, GPA. That's what I just want to declare. And what, yeah, and what's the second class? Because it might be an upper or a lower because when it's an yes, upper, upper. Uh, yeah, I think when it's an upper. upper, yeah, when it's an upper and it's a bit strong, I think the tendency of you getting it is is, is high. But when, when, when it's not that strong, then it's going to be an issue. And also it depends on the school, right? So here you are competing with top students coming in. So uh, teaching assistantship is not that hard. They don't use your GPA to give you teaching assistantship. If you are in the system, they will just post the teaching assistantship on the school's website or the department's website and you can easily apply and you might, you might get it. But the difficulty here is the actual scholarship itself. And I don't know whether you were here when I mentioned the different streams of funding. The actual scholarship is, itself, yeah. when, yeah, for the actual scholarship itself with an APA, it's going to be very, very difficult. But when you are talking about teaching assistantship, bursaries, and the rest, then APA you can equally qualify for. Does that address your question? Okay. Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Sure. 
any uh, any follow up question on that questions sorry guys questions um, okay i think we are just about time um, anyone with any questions there? yes please go ahead I uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and then your team. I think uh, it's very helpful. Sure. Um, sir, um, please, uh, I have two questions, and I actually, I actually went off, so I don't know whether you've addressed that question with regards to uh, using the Empower loan as a proof of fund. And second, uh, my question is: Last year, I made some applications to schools in the US, and I have a business background, but. I, I graduated in 2020, so I do not have enough uh, work experience. And that, uh, I think I tried to sort for a scholarship and the rest, and it was very difficult for me. So I don't know if there is a way out or probably, is it because we in the business sector, it's very difficult to get funds from the school? Yeah, I think I, I addressed the issue of the business, um, the difficulty related the, to the business field earlier. And it's also... Uh, is there someone with a mic on? Uh, sorry, let me just quickly mute. Mute. Yeah. So the reason why we have difficulty, the reason why we have difficulty with um, those in the business related field, as I mentioned earlier, is it's mostly designed for the executives or those already working here in North America. So that's why you tend to see that the fees are very much, I mean, they are high and getting in is very difficult. I, I made the point earlier, so hopefully you can have a look at it as uh, from the recording. Um, from For your first question, the Empower loan, I don't know how that works and I don't have any detail on that. So um, unfortunately, I wouldn't be in a position to comment unless, of course, uh, if you have any further clarifications that can help me understand what the loan is about. Uh, maybe I can help, but for now, I don't know what Empower Loan is and how it works. I don't know. Sorry about that. Um, Brother Farouk? No, yeah, uh, Fulira, go ahead. So um, the Empower Loan is, is, is an organization that um, gives loan to international students, and they mm -hmm. also say they help with visa application. Mm -hmm. So you apply to it, they have like a long application process actually and documents, mm. a lot of documents you have to present. Mm. And I think they'll, they'll give you like a proof of funds or something at, mm. that you have to present to the um, IRCC when submitting your document to um, ask your application or for the visa. Mm. But as to whether it's advisable to use it or not i don't know anyone who has used it before so i don't know yeah but i once asked sister fauzia like if it's advisable to take a loan from empower and um she did like a calculation on the interest and she said um, like it's too much no oh, okay no, you okay. have too much interest so it's not yeah. advisable to take loan from empower yeah so that is what i know okay. but they also have scholarship opportunities um, there that you can apply for, but I also don't know anyone who has gotten it. I've actually applied for about three or four before because they have monthly scholarship before the main ones, but I've not gotten any feedback from them or anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I think um, Fulira, thanks a lot for the clarification. I think that that helps um clarify the situation. Yeah, um, we 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 are very mindful. To I mean, offer advice that we 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 are not very I mean hundred percent sure about. So for that reason, I think we we probably might want to pass on this question. We don't have any I mean comments on it. Sorry, um, Eric. Um, if there is any further follow up questions, let me know. Um, Derek, please. Um, let me know if you have questions. Falila, to let me know. Um, you can um, equally. Sorry, just a quick one. Um, to the per, um to the individual who asked about the Empower loan. Uh, you can you can equally get in touch with um, Fulera, get to see whether she can clarify further. And um, as she mentioned earlier, the interest might just be too much as well. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Um, is it Derek? Yeah, Derek, go ahead. Brother Farouk, th thanks uh, for this opportunity. And then uh, we are grateful for all that you are doing. Sure. Um, my, my, my concern is... Uh, I kind of have finished university, like my first degree uh, for a while now, like way back 2011. But then I've done MED 
and then uh, I wanted to do use it to do maybe a, a, a MSc. Is it advisable? So MED, um, MED, what does MED um, mean? Is it education or is it? So... MED, Master's in Education, uh, Measurement and Evaluation. Oh, I think um, Fulera can take that one because she has a Master's in Education. Fulera, okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, so a transition from M the the one I have met is she's like she had a master's in 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 Manitoba, so she was able to transition from a master's program to a, an education pro program. So I think uh, I think what is important is convincing them like of your transition because she did MSc and she transit she transitioned to a PhD in education. But she, her research like perspective is along the lines of the science in education. So I think um, it all boils down to um, convincing them that like this is what you you acquired in Emmet and this is how you are going to use it or utilize it in like an MSc program or something. Yeah. Thank you very very much. Answers your question. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I wanted to find out whether it's uh, whether it was possible, but uh, it's you have addressed. Not possible. It just depends how you 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 write it out, how you convince them. Yep. Okay. Thank you very very much. And I, yeah, I know, and I also find education to be very very accommodative in the sense that no matter the um the period that you are away, the fact that you are in the classroom gives you the uh, the opportunity to write something, right? So if, for instance, also we have uh, what's the name? There's there's an education program here at SFU. Um, they are very much relaxed. Uh, they they take professionals regardless of the number of time, the years that they've been out of. Uh, I mean, school. So I, I don't think that should be a major head or Derek. You should be in a position to, I mean, aim for something. Let's see what pans out. And and also, um, I think even the years you are out, if you have like professional experience to show for it, is like they even value that. Mm -hmm. It means you've been practicing, so you know methods, you know practices that you are willing to bring into the classroom experience. So. Mm -hmm. Like even some programs, they they like state that you should have this number year of years like of teaching experience, you know. So even that teaching experience is very important. Yeah. Uh, Sister Flera, uh, thank you. I I I we I will try to uh, contact you. Maybe uh, DM you and um, Brother Faruk. I I WhatsApp you also, and then maybe you help me out on that front. I beg you. No problem. No problem. Yeah. yeah, happy to. Thank you. Sure. Um, anyone with any? Let's take two more questions, and hopefully we can call it um a day. Two more questions. Um, if you've not asked, if you've not asked any question, please um feel free to use the mic. If if yeah, I think I don't know whether iPhone and Imran you've asked any question yet. Imran or iPhone. Imran. This this Imran again. Oh, again, okay. Let me see whether iPhone <laughs> has already asked. Um, if if not, then or oh, Andrew, anyone, um, if you've not asked any question, feel free to use the mic. If you guys are not in the position, hopefully, Imran can come back and ask more. Andrew, Hi, good evening, good evening, yes, Go ahead, Andrew. thank you. Um, well. thank you for the space. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, um, how I know we'll be doing this over the weeks, so mm -hmm. looking forward to it, but I want to ask how an applicant can navigate not having a thesis because I, I also did an MA in education but I didn't do the thesis I did the teaching option so I did uh, a practice and then we just did like uh, a proposal but I didn't get to carry out a project and then write a full thesis so when you're applying and they're asking for a writing sample like Heavy, what what do I do? Because my undergrad was also a bit different from my MA in education. So how do I navigate that? Yeah. Um maybe Sister Fulera would take this, but let me quickly give you one um additional data points. Um maybe it, that might help. So my wife did statistics 
for her undergrad. And uh, when she came to Canada, she did education. Uh, so that's that's to tell you something. So she had no, I mean, material or written material related to education or thesis along those lines. Uh, it's just the program. So it's up to you to look out for the program. Some of them will not ask you to present anything related to um, maybe a thesis or education. Some of them are very open. So I can I can point you to SFU. SFU, they do have a very good program on, in education. Um, that would be an avenue for you to explore. I think Saskatchewan also has education. Manitoba has education. Flora can take over. Maybe she can further clarify. Yeah, so I was going to say that it's not a problem if he did, because as of now, I'm doing education, but I'm doing the course base. I'm taking the course base route, so I'm not doing any major research. But at the end of my program, I'll just like write a paper on a chosen topic. So if they ask for something, a write up in your like explanation, they can they would see or your documents they would see that you took the course base route. They will see the courses you took. Then you can present your final paper, not any major research because you didn't take a thesis based route. You present your final paper as like your writing sample or anything of that sort. Or even during your coursework, let's say now, I don't know, let's say now after um, our term, we are to write like a paper on any chosen topic. You can present that as your writing sample. If you think you did like a good job on the paper, like it can represent you well, then you can because not all master master's program is um, um, thesis based. We have course based routes too. Yeah, so that's what I have to say. Thanks Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, um, there are a lot of questions. Um, uh, before we come back to Imran, let me take Happy Adams. If you've not yet, I mean, asked any question, please feel free to use the mic. We can take two or three more. Then hopefully we can. Uh, give our organizers some rest. Okay. Um, happy here. Thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. So I wanted to find out, um, I'm about to enroll in a master's program in HR mm. here in Ghana. Mm. So I wanted to know if I can transition from HR to um, industrial and organizational psychology as like a second master's in Canada. I think the, the, the question here is, have you seen any school that offers that in Canada in terms of this particular um, program orientation? Have you seen have you seen something along those lines? Um, I read about University of Western Ontario hmm. and the um, industrial organization psychology program is actually, it has to do with a lot of HR, hmm. um, yeah, recruitment and all those stuff. So I wanted to find out if yeah. it is possible I think my advice will be for you to check the pre um the prerequisites. So if you are doing a master's in Ghana and you would like to I mean do a, another master's in um in that particular school because they have the same um they have something that you like have a look at the prerequisites. A prerequisite basically says that so in economics a prerequisite implies that if you don't have math micro and uh, macroeconomics you cannot apply to the you it's very difficult for 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 the school to accept you right so have a look at the prerequisites what are the prerequisites required so if you are doing a master's program in Ghana and all the courses you are taking don't align in terms of the prerequisite requirements for the master's program in Canada then there's going to be some element of difficulty for you now there are there are other schools as well if if you are interested in psychology and apply psychology and what's not you can transition you can transition and by transit by transitioning i mean you don't necessarily have to pick um a program that's more along the lines of a special program so if you have an element of psychology in there or you have an element of um, political science in there. You can look at schools that offer maybe psychology um, master's program and apply to those. That will give you an edge because there's no, there's no, I mean, restrictions that much, right? And when you have to complete the program, you can have a look at something along the lines of um, a special program. That will be my take on that. And again, I might be okay. a bit limited in this response. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Anytime. 
Um, I don't know whether Anthony has or anyone in there. I'm happy to take one or two questions and we can call it a day. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Sorry. Okay. So, um, Professor Farouk, I wanted to find out, you know, um, your, I watched your YouTube videos for the previous years where one professor talked about uh, Ghanaians being admitted to Canadian schools in terms like for the economic department. Yeah. So um, I'm talking in terms of um, engineering mm -hmm. students who want to pursue a master's degree in Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have a far idea about um, some schools in Canada where um, they admitted Ghanaians in their engineering department and then they performed well? So it will be like an upper hand for we applying to those schools. Yeah, I think if you're in the if you're in the engineering field, um, Professor Solomon will be a very good resource for us. Hopefully, he will be joining us okay. soon. And I don't know whether you've been able to link up with him using his um uh, using his WhatsApp group link that I sent on the page. If you haven't, let me know. Um, I can send it to yeah. you. So engineering, I think they've done. I mean amazing work in University of Manitoba where Fatih currently is. She she's in, in in the engineering department. Professor Solomon also has taken in a lot of Ghanaian students in his lab. Um, I think Professor Solomon will be in a position to give um, you guys a very good overview of the performance of Ghanaians in the field of engineering. But for now, these are the two schools that I can really, I mean, speak to Manitoba as well as where Professor Solomon is currently, which is University yep. of York. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Yeah, iPhone. Yeah, hello, ahead. good evening. Good evening, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm a Nigerian actually, but mm. I've benefited <laughs> so much being amongst you guys. Mm -hmm. So my question is is more or less like I'm seeking an advice. Mm -hmm. I had my Bachelor of Science in 2016 mm -hmm. then i i proceeded for my masters in the same field mm -hmm. but due to the covid and as strike we have in our country mm -hmm. it took me four and a half years mm -hmm. to to complete the masters mm -hmm. which was supposed to be in two months <clears throat> mm -hmm. so i want to further my education mm -hmm. so where i'm confused is should i put in for masters in Canadian school or PhD, because from the advice you have been given, you said the admission chances decreases with number of years. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I can hear you. Go ahead. Sorry. Because you said the admission chances decreases with number of years. Looking at um, if I'm to apply for master's degree, looking at 2016 till 2023. Mm. And yeah. as for the PhD, you said I have to write um, a qualifying exam, which is very difficult and not easy to pass if I mm. got you correctly. Mm. Yeah. So let me, yeah, I don't know whether, yeah, that was a, that was a very good question. Um, To answer it, to answer it, I think, uh, let me also clarify the very first point. The fact that you've been out of school for long, what I mean by the chances being not being that bright is if you're out of school for long and you're not taking any special courses, any certificate, the tendency of you be becoming rusty is going to be very high, right? Um, there, there are always developments, new ideas, new methodologies in your field. And if you're out, out of that particular field for long, the admission department will surely, I mean, consider, I mean, some of these lags and they might go like, hey, you don't have enough to show. Some will ask you to take some special, I mean, exam just to show, just to show that, hey, you are up to date. But others will, will just, I mean, overlook your application and go like, it's, it's just been too long and, they don't know how relevant or how up to date you are with your with your understanding of the field. So that's that's a point that you probably might want to consider. We do have Professor um, Asuma. 
he was out of he can speak to this so hopefully when we have a session with him i think that would be a very good time for you to ask this question he can clarify and tell you how to navigate through um this i mean lag period but my my advice and again i'm not trying to limit um those interested in a phd program but i'll i'll, I'll rather hit you guys without if i don't mention it my advice is if you're coming for a PhD in North America, get to know what is the requirement in the first year. Most often than not, the first year is going to be a comprehensive exam. And you've been, if you've been out of school for long and you're coming to a new school, a new environment, a new country, a new weather, within the within that same time period, they are asking you to take a very difficult exam. You can imagine the difficulty that will come with that, the stress yes, that yes. will come with that. So you have to be a bit more strategic. So there's always the need for you to step back and go like, I understand I can do this PhD. I understand I have the uh, the mental capacity to, I mean, take it, but I don't want to risk yes. myself. I don't want to stress myself too much. How about taking yes. the master's route? Within the master's route, they will see my qualifications and they can go like, hey, the department is interested in keeping you and they would like you to continue with a PhD. It happens. My case, I was in Manitoba. I was doing my master's program. They said, hey, your grades are good. Do you want to go ahead and continue with the PhD program? And I was like, no, I want to try somewhere different. So uh, just calculate it, get to know the pros and cons before making the move. I don't know whether that answers it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank sure. you. Sure. Hello. Yeah, Thank go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. This is Abdullah once again. Yeah, go Let's ahead. Let's come for another clarification. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, myself too. I'm 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 out of school since twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, since sorry, since twenty seventeen. Even sure. though I read uh, religious studies and sociology as a uh, first degree. Uh, I am almost done with my master's degree. Abdullah, sorry, your line is. Hello, Abdullah, can you hear me? Degree, but I've, I've diverted the application. Advice of the first degree. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yes. So I was I was saying that in case I am I am almost done with the second degree, mm -hmm. and in case I am sending an application, for instance, I want to go in for public policy. Mm -hmm. uh, is it should I use the the second degree or the first degree, or I can use both? Um, it depends, right? So you should use both if if they are all good. If you've done very good in the two, use both. I think um, if you restrict and you just use only one. Um, they would they, the issue will appear to them that you've been out of school for long and you've don't you don't have anything recent in terms of education. So using both certificates, if I understand you correctly, and, um, it shows that hey you are yeah. still in school and you are taking um all the relevant courses. It also it it also depends on how you structure your CV along those lines as well. So just make sure your CV is up to date. You can have a look at the session that I had with the students in how to get your CV up to date. Have a look at that. See how best that can equally address your your concern. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Anytime. We are a bit out of time um, now. Imran, I think we've answered your question. Um, is there anyone in there who hasn't asked any question yet? If if we've already asked, um, I think this will be a time for us to drop because it's been almost two hours. Um, I have a go... short question if I can ask. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. When you say um, when you're like the period of time you graduated to the time you're applying for school, how long should that period be or what is the recommended when would you say your chances are slimmer if you've extended maybe this number of years? Um, I don't, I, I don't think there's a clear cut rule to that. I think it's more or less like um a hidden um secret, kind of. I think two years should be okay. Um, two years with you being in the field should be fine. Um, three years, okay. 
if you have something to show, some short, short courses to show, but somewhere along the lines of four to five years, and that when the course is also more math oriented, then you will be at a disadvantage. But if it is four to five years, but you are you are in the field of education, just like what Fulera mentioned, then it's not going to be to your to your disadvantage. It's going to be to your advantage. If it is four to five years and you're applying to um MBA program and you are already a professional, it's not going to be your disadvantage. It's going to be to your advantage because they want someone with an experience. So you have to look at the field first. Get to see um how related are they if you're an engineering student and you've been out of school for long and you're not doing anything related to engineering and your math is rusty then that will be to your disadvantage so it can be a blessing it can be a curse you just have to look at where you fall thanks very much sure sure i think we are yeah um almost right almost almost Okay, um, I think we will give our Nigerian colleague the very last chance to ask a question. Then we we'll go to Eric. Then we we'll close for today. Oh, she's gone. Okay, then I think that's good. Um, Eric, do you have any question? Any follow up? Okay, that's good. Then I think that's just about it for today. Thanks, um, everyone for I mean joining to the organizers. Thank you very much for your time and answer. Uh, Hopefully I can uh, answer some of the questions offline. Please make sure to use the WhatsApp group. The, uh, we can answer some of the questions there as well. Take care everyone. And I wish you guys all the best in your application process. Bye. Thank you. Sure, all the best guys.